All right, so we will record this session and then they will be available um, later on and you should have the links to those. So, so I'm Liz Martinez. I'm excited that you're here today and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how to integrate ELA into um, science, um, science into ELA. And if we look at, let me just see how we're going to do here for just a moment. I will tell you that this has been, of course, lagging behind today. What are you seeing? Are you seeing the uh, screen that says K5 integrating ALI and science? Thumbs up, thumbs yes. down. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, like I said, it's been goofy today. But um, I just put this little illustration on here. If we look at the time that's allowed in uh, traditional elementary school, I mean, K-5, K-4, K-6, however it is grouped together in a building or in a district, the number of minutes per week on science, um, very, very low. And we know that, uh, obviously I'm biased, I'll put that out there first, but we know how important science education is uh, in developing uh, a literate citizen. So that's why I kind of put that balancing act there, because we also know that even though science is great, it's, it's a roll your hands up, uh, roll your sleeves up, get your hands in there. Um, it's a participatory, of course. Uh, it hasn't been weighted much in the past because it hasn't been tested a lot as well. And it's a different type of teaching. So we're going to look a little bit at the role of persistence, um, the connections among the different standards. And then we have a whole lot of sample NGSS lessons on our Digital Commons website, which we'll go over in just a second, um, that you are free to download. Anybody can download them. Um, all the materials are there, etc. We'll talk about some books to help those specific lessons. So, here we go. And at any time, drop some questions in, or if I miss your question in the chat box, um, Go ahead and jump in on your microphone. So this is the digital commons that I was talking about. All of the sessions today, you'll have access to this. Um, and there are lots of different things from the sessions that we've done in the past, uh, presentations the whole team has done in the past across the country and in the state, but it's open educational resources. So again, you don't have to pay for anything. So if you just Google digital commons IMSA, but you have to put IMSA in because digital commons is a university nationwide uh, type system. You get our little digital commons. You can go down, you can browse it. Uh, OERs, the Open Educational Resources, those are the free things. And you can see there are all sorts of things here. And then when I was looking at it, that, this is where it appeared on my screen. But if you click on that, you get all of our sample lessons that we developed in collaboration with the State Board of Education. Okay. So, here we go. Um, when I was getting this together, one of the things that is mentioned, particularly in Common Core math standards, is that idea of continuing to work at a problem, being persistent, that tenacity, that grit, that determination. Um, and it's not specifically called out in science as it is in the Common Core math standards, but it's implied there and it has to be there. So these were a few quotes that I found very interesting. That first one, take a quick peek at it. I just That whole idea of, again, sticking to it. And then that middle one is really, really important. And uh, some of us have those students who just don't want to let go, or maybe as an adult, we haven't wanted to let something go, but we need to know we've invested in it. This is where we're going in science. This is going um, in a direction that might be helpful. So we continue, or there becomes a point where we need to stop and move on to a different project or a different approach. Um, in real life, it's time constraints, it's money constraints and material constraints as well. And number three then really applies to engineering. Okay, so let's take a look here. What are some additional um, type of reading sources, sources that can support that informa informational text? So take a look on here. You can see all sorts of different things. Uh, somebody had mentioned earlier about washing their hands, right? It's Sarah, I believe it was you. But a poster like that, um, a public service announcement like that can be something. Uh, all sorts of diagrams, maps, uh, graphs, even younger students can start graphing. Uh, the drawings that the students make, um, and in the bottom left-hand side, I just dropped in a picture of Tom Skilling, but you know, some uh, interviews are really good. Check 
with, particularly when it comes to science content, check with your local um, University of Illinois, uh, should you have an extension office, that's a really good place to find speakers. Uh, also to check with your community colleges. There might be somebody who's able to go ahead and, you know, give just 10 minutes of their time uh, to help with the students and, and being another source here. Um, another place that takes for me a little more time to uh, delve through and hunt through, but is loaded uh, would be the National Archives as well as the Library of Congress. And there are tutorials on those sites and because they're .gov, it's all free to us uh, to, uh, to use, so, okay. So what I try to do here was kind of look back at um, ELA standards and just pull little pieces out. Uh, and you can see this is the K first grade. Uh, we have reading is gonna be consistently in the yellow box, uh, the writing in our green, and then the blues speaking and listening. So again, these are just pieces of standards from Common Core that are pulled out that I felt were very applicable to what we're gonna talk about today. So here we go. Kindergarten teachers, we have a lot of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. Patience, patience, patience is what you have. But let's think about what you do on a daily basis. You do some calendar work, yes. You do some uh, forecasting, talking about the weather, keeping track of that so you have some data as you go along. So as we take a look about this, at this, um, these are some books that may help you. And I kind of had, I guess, winter on my mind when I put this together. But what we talk about for kindergarten can be changed up based on the season there. You as teachers, particularly elementary teachers, have so many great skills. You really, really do. And one of the things that I admire so much is the ability to read books with students. Even books, for example, that one in kind of the center there, what pushes, what pulls, the text might be too complicated for students. They have uh, sight words. It might not be a picture book, but you know how to get that information across. You know how to lead them through making observations of the pictures. So that's where a lot of the reading can come in as well. Okay. And it supports that whole interdisciplinary. If we went back to the, um, the previous page with parts of the, the standards on it, you would see how well they integrate there. So let's take a very specific uh, look here. So in kindergarten, one of the science standards is the idea of pushing and pulling. Um, something just doesn't happen. You need to apply a force to it. So uh, most of the students out of the state of Illinois can relate to snow. So in this activity uh, that we have put together for our kindergartners is designing a snow shovel that would be best for them to use. Right, with the idea of applying push and pull. So we start out with taking a look at some pictures and all of these things, if you download it, are right there for you. I will tell you, I never had a color copier at a school. It was called going to FedEx or someplace like that and paying for it. So these pictures, please know, will print out in black and white and be fine. Right, that's why we specifically put those in there. But what happens is, um, we talk a little bit about snow. We have the students look at this multiple uh, pictures. These are just two examples here and kind of talk about, oh, what's going on? You know, what do you notice? What are you curious about? If you were in that house, how would you get out? If you were just getting home from school, what would you do to get in? And eventually it leads to the idea of a snow shovel. So what we do then is we supply them um, with three different types of shovels, if you will. You know, those wooden malt spoons? that are kind of, um, I don't know, they look kind of like propeller shaped to me. Uh, that's what we've used. We have also given them like a little gelato spoon and also a little ice cream taster spoon. So it looks like a regular spoon just in the size that their hands um, can handle. And what we ask them to do, we give them fake snow, like crushed ice, or if it is snowing and you feel like going out and getting some and bringing it in, um, but something to simulate that. Let me just give you a fair warning. Um, I think I tried, uh, like some little styrofoam type beads in that, too much static electricity. So I made that mistake for you. Uh, you don't need to go ahead and make that there. But what they do is they go ahead and they work through this idea of um, pushing and pulling. How does this work? Drawing their observations, writing some things down, just a simple checklist. Again, that fits in with ELA, right? Making the observations so that you have that information to go ahead and make your argument or your discussion from. So we look at traits, characteristics, whatever the flavor uh, of the day is for the word that your reading program is using at that time. So a few things, these are 
pictures from our teachers at PD. So they might look a little bit different than the ones from the kindergarten, but they've identified what they like about each of their three shovels. They've identified how they work. They've identified the characteristics that they think are best. And also look at the characteristics on the other side of the coin that they don't think would be super valuable. Then they go ahead and they design this. And we wanna pull a science in with push and pull. So push and pull, your students might not be able to write, some of you have some students who can, so you could put a little uh, push on one card, pull on another card, put a set of those cards out, put a set of arrows out, because labeling a diagram is also a connection to ELA, and it's really important developmentally um, and to help our students start to get that, that deeper cognitive level. Um, so the one thing that I want to pull out here and just uh, maybe have a discussion about, you can drop some comments uh, if you wish in the chat box or unmute yourself is, I'll be honest, I love crafts. I love doing crafts. But what's the difference between a craft and how do I take this to the science lesson where they're getting the content out of it? So we need to make that, uh, that change from craft to science and actually doing it. So what would I need to make sure that I do with my students or have my students experience to go from, oh, this is just kind of a cool art project, kind of a cool, fun project. What do I need to make sure? You want to drop some ideas in the chat box, please? What do we have there? Yep, exactly, Chris, making those connections. All right. And we have to be pretty deliberate about, yeah, graphing. Oh, that's right. That's so good. That's so good. And, we, and when we said uh, at the beginning, we said that even little ones can graph, right? Um, so even though this is focused on ELA, obviously mathematics is a very natural connection. Just hit, uh, hit the common, standard, uh, common core standards again for math and you can find out how many things they're able to graph at the different ages, what types of graphs are appropriate. Okay, now one of the things that they're doing here a lot, yes, 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 Rachel, that's outstanding, right? So that's what we're getting at here too. So oftentimes we have, the students collect some data, right? But we're like, kind of like, so what? Apply it. So Rachel, that definitely gives them a chance to apply that. All right, let's do this right now. And let's move on. Okay, so we want the students to explain in the end. We want them to be able to make up their, uh, use their sense making. Yes, yes, Lydia, I like that. I like that. And you know what? I'm going to pull out on that word imagination there, Lydia. Science needs imagination. But oftentimes, there's a stereotype that science fits in this little box. Um, ask your students sometimes to draw a scientist and think of the pictures that they come up with, right? There's not necessarily the creativity involved, but we definitely need that. But one of the things that I wanted to bring up here, because another uh, standard when it comes to science at kindergarten is that animals need to use nature to survive is kind of a general uh, generalization of that standard. So we have an activity called build a nest. Okay. The students talk a little bit about, um, you know, animals, what do they need to survive? Where do they live? You can get into the idea of houses. Um, and then what they do then is they go ahead and depending upon what materials you have available, uh, again, uh, raffia is what I use. I was able to find it like at the dollar store, cotton balls. Um, it has varied from time to time, again, because of my, um, my budget and we wanted to keep these budget friendly, but they go ahead and they design a nest. Now, in this case, we said that the animal was going to have eggs because that was something that they could have concrete in their hands. So most of them said it was a bird, but they had a list of materials. So we had cotton balls, we've had the raffia, as I said, um, sometimes paper, like little shredded paper, sometimes feathers, different types of things. But they look at these materials and they say, all right, I want to build a nest. I have, let's say the raffia available. Why would I use that? Or why wouldn't I use it? So this is the animal that I want to make a home for, a nest for, and they've got to make the observations of the materials, which are really important in science as well as ELA. And again, they're making that uh, connection that I'm trying to think of. I have to go, whoops, sorry, back there. Uh, 
to see somebody brought that up. Christy, you brought that up about making that connection. All right. So I'm purposely choosing these materials and I'm going to purposely use them for this. And then if you have time going back to what Lydia said, um, they have this idea. They made the hypothesis and uh, it was also stated too that giving the chance to test, right? So if you had some little stuffed animal, please don't bring any live things in to test these nests, thought you could. Now some books to support this. Um, a lot of Eric Carle books, so wonderful, so wonderful. And if you are at grade level where you need to teach about light, they're really great because the way that he made his pictures was using layers of tissue paper and putting them together. So you could see how the light would travel through and make those different colors together. Um, a nest is noisy, an egg is quiet. Have you heard of the, any of those before? Um, by Diana Hutt, uh, fabulous. And the illustrations in there are incredibly accurate and just enticing and engaging. Now, a nest is noisy as well as her other books. The reading level is way too high, but again, you know what information to share. Um, and the pictures, yes, yeah, sir, I like that. I like that. Um, but the pictures there's, are so rich. There's so much information to take out of them. What if we read this book that shows these beautiful nests before we had them build their nests? What might our students do? They'll try to match what you made. Exactly. So that in science, we really have to be cautious about. So I would suggest um, whether it's the uh, the seahorse swan by our car, the nest is noisy, or the sleepy, snoozy, cozy, koozy is really great as well. That we have the students make the nest, explain why they used what they did, because they based on their observations, so employing the observational skill, and then going and reading some of these books as well. Um, I included the seahorse one because seahorses, it's kind of interesting if you look at their life cycle about who takes care of the animals, the babies, the young, and uh, how they go about it. Okay. So, oh, I like that too, Sarah. They can go ahead and take a look at it, right? Ahead of time. So they can um, also uh, kind of hone in on what they're interested in as well. Okay, first grade, here we go. Biomimicry is huge. It's basically humans stealing from nature. All right. I have an idea that we found in nature. For example, this is a lotus leaf uh, that I had seen in the garden over in London, and there was some water sitting on it. You'll notice the water is pooled, right? I don't know if you've ever had house plants that you needed to dust, or um, I worked in a greenhouse where we did have to dust our plants off before you sell them. There's this stuff called leaf shine that helps you do it, kind of like pledge or end dust. Um, but the lotus leaf, it's the water in it, and it's able to kind of roll around in the shape of the leaf. It's kind of a, you know, like a little dish, not too deep, and that helps to clean the leaf. But you can see again how the water collects there. This was the inspiration for stain resistant fabric. And several other students probably know that burrs um, that they find in the, in the woods or field were the inspiration for Velcro because they stuck so well. And if you looked at the end of the burrs uh, with a hand lens or under a microscope, you'll see that it's a little bit curved. So that helped to get that idea to link those two sides of the, um, the Velcro together. Here is a great book, Mimic Makers. The reading level is extremely high, the Lexile level. But again, the pictures are unbelievable. On the front, you can kind of see there's that whale, but above it, there's that bird that was an inspiration for the bullet trains, right? Um, shark skins, swimsuits for the aerodynamics of it. Uh, armadillos. There was, I wanna say it was Columbia several years ago made this backpack that was like a shell that would, when a, you would bend over, it would kind of extend and expand. And then when you stood up, it would kind of, um, the scales or the little sections would slide over each other. So it adjusted to your activities. And if you think about an armadillo and how they can roll up and their shell kind of comes undone and these sections stretches with them. And then when they stand up, it goes back together. So again, the idea of stealing from nature. So here is another great book because trying to find books that 
lexile level is appropriate for this age, and in, um, the idea of biomimicry is tough. These are some more examples from around the world. Um, in Illinois, you don't have to worry too much about water, oftentimes drinking, but a lot of places do. So in this case, if you leave something out overnight, you know how if it's damp in particular, it, the water condenses on it. They found a way to go ahead and collect this then so that they could go ahead and have some drinking water. So the illustrations are wonderful. And again, you could let them explore if you wanted to, like Sarah had said earlier, or you could read this afterward. Uh, but again, talk about the pictures and those observations. What I really, really like about these two books in this one in particular is these are probably some examples that the students are not familiar with. Okay. All right, questions so far because you're just hearing me. Is this Mimic Makers, this book? This uh, yes, is in the Mimic Makers. And what you're gonna get at the end on, on um, the digital comments is there's a multi-page level of some books. Uh, the first column is the unit or lesson that we made. Uh, it talks a little bit about some books that you could use and kind of a summary of each of the books here. Okay, so that's for you for um, for K-5 that we talk about. I'm sorry, I should have told you that before. So then in this project or this lesson, we have them engineer something. How could something like this be related to ELA? Does it look familiar to anything they do as far as yep, vocabulary building? It looks like a graphic organizer we would use for organizing what we've learned. Exactly, exactly. So again, yep, detail, concept mapping, the graphic organizer, all sorts of things. Now, this one obviously would be a whole lot for a, uh, a younger one to take a look at. Um, but there are lots of different ways. You're really good at doing graphic organizing, helping your students organize their writing, organizing their thoughts. So this again is a natural place for this to occur, okay? Um, so let me just take a quick look at my notes. Uh, I wanted to go back to perseverance here because they might come up with an idea and all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute. So I have a turtle, they have this really cool shell and so taking a shell and the shape and something hard could make a great helmet. But I think, wait a minute, that's just not really good if I'm roller skating or trying to learn to skateboard or something like that. So that, that persistence to keep following from, oh, to an idea, but also that ability to say, maybe I should try something else. So that can definitely be here. Um, so here we go on. Remember how we mentioned light earlier? Um, Eric Carl books, again, can definitely help out. But first grade, oh my goodness. If you've taught science for a while um, and have gone from our old standards in the state to NGSS, it's really interesting the, how the, uh, the content, the concepts have been changed around to different grade levels because now we have studied and we know much more about how students learn and that they are very capable um, where they've sometimes, particularly younger students, been sold short when it comes to science. Okay. So on the right-hand side, that's a picture I took in the museum campus uh, in the city. So it was kind of a really cool example of light, but what we do in this is uh, we have them take a look at a kaleidoscope. And I will tell you that I checked last night and on Oriental Trading, they were still a dozen for like $11.99 plus shipping. Uh, and they are the kind that they can take apart if they need to, you want to let them do it. It's not like a $150 really nice kaleidoscope that we're gonna be like, well, careful, I don't want you to drop it and break the lens. But what we do is um, we have them first of all, take a, a look and, and use a kaleidoscope. Some students have seen it, some students haven't seen it. It's not important to get the word kaleidoscope in their vocabulary. What's important is for them to take a look at Wait a minute, when I twist this thing, it does this. I'm seeing different shapes like, I'm seeing different colors. I'm seeing some things being reflected in there. And then uh, we use, you know, those triangle shape beads. 
they're used a lot for uh, crafts. Um, what are they called now? I looked it up again last night. Acrylic bone shaped triangle beads, right? Um, again, you can get them oriented in uh, lots of different places. Just do a Google search for it and you'll come up with a lot. But we have them, all right, they look through this and their job is to make a toy that uses light in a similar way. We provide um, like cardstock, they like it. They could use uh, aluminum foil, but we just use two cups um, that are clear, they're transparent so that they could, if they choose to, they can have one cup, put the beads in the bottom, whatever else they wanna put in there, figure it out, uh, different colors of tissue paper in there. And then they just put the other cup on top and that way they have something that they could twist and look through, but they can also take it apart because someone had mentioned earlier about uh, doing the engineering, that testing and then redesigning. So again, all of these are on, um, on the website, but you can see here again that they're gonna make observations because they test the materials prior to putting everything together. I don't know about your students, but I spent most of my years in uh, middle school teaching them. And even then, if you, whatever you put out at one time, they will come take as much of it. It's like a buffet, right? A smorgasbord for them. So we have to be deliberate about, you know, we're gonna try this first and then try this first. Make your decisions based on your observations and then go get what you need and put these together. So in this case, this is just a flashlight and that represents, it could be, um, it could be like a file folder that's red. It could be a piece of yellow tissue paper, but you wanna get things that are transparent, translucent, and opaque. Those three words are not used. They can tag those words later on as they get older in the progression of the NGSS standards. Okay, so they talk about, all right, I've looked at this, so I could potentially use tissue paper to do such and such because of the way that the light goes through it. Um, and you can see down below, we talk about passes through, does not pass through, bounces off or reflects, um, and they can come up with different words. They're recording it once again, they're putting it together, they're testing it. Okay, so again, that connection, uh, so it takes it from the craft project level to a, a science situation. All right. And there are several books that are listed there um, on that book list for you as well. All right, so let's go on to second and third grade. Uh, are patterns in ELA? Lots of patterns, right? Uh, relationships? So this is where in particular in second grade, um, they get into the idea that uh, there are systems and system models. That's one of the, um, the uh, cross-cutting concepts. Um, cause and effect, and that's a big one in ELA as well, right? Uh, so we're looking here, and these are just some different books. I will tell you there's a wide Lexile range here on purpose. Uh, the Grand Canyon has a really great, when you get to the center, like a four-page fold-out, so you kind of get a panoramic view of the Grand Canyon. The geography from A to Z is your stereotypical glossary. Um, land and water is really kind of neat because it has one picture and when you open the next page, it takes to like a different landform. So it's kind of a continuous building of, this, of a landscape. Uh, and one of these is just a picture book, right? All of them can be used appropriately here. So during the lesson, what the students do is you provide for them uh, some cards. And their job is to Take a look at these cards and there are different sets uh, again of Lexile levels very purposely put together for this and again it's not critical and it's not important that they tag the word geyser and know exactly what a geyser is they're going to build a model because they need to know that there are different landforms and these landforms are somehow dependent upon each other they're part of a system so we just use play-doh because that's what we had available you have something else that you can model with, um, knowing again that with some of the Play-Dohs and Clays, there's that tactile portion that bothers some students. Um, and just on a teacher tip side, uh, I laminated the paper so it could be reused, wiped off and reused. Uh, but again, that was pre-COVID, so you just might need to get uh, new paper each time we go along. But as they do this, and you can see a couple examples of models there. They decide as a group, well, what might a river look like? What shape might it have? Where do we want to put this on the model? 
and then the one on the bottom right, then there's a lake. Well, let's build a lake. How are a lake and a river connected to one another? How do they impact one another? And then with this activity, what we have them do is shuffle their cards and do like a gallery walk. So your group goes to the next one. And what your group tries to do is to match, again, let's stick with the bottom one there. My group comes up, we try to put lake by whatever we think the lake is on the model. Again, it's not the purpose for them to know the landforms, but the idea that there are landforms and somehow they're connected. So they can get exposed to some different ideas, um, not only with the idea of landforms, but that people approach the task in a different way and were successful as well. You can see one thing again, I crossed out here. You're gonna keep seeing it um, in NGSS. We're not memorizing things at this point, but these are the things that are important. And again, if you look at speaking, listening and speaking, so critical in ELA as well. This PowerPoint is also available on Digital Commons for you too. Uh, all of them will be from today. All right, so uh, let's move to this whole idea of evidence, cause and effect, again, very uh, prevalent throughout ELA. You know what? It's also important and prevalent in mathematics, um, history, social studies, geography, whatever you're going to call it um, in, your, in your school. In this case, though, students are going to take a look at the idea of pollination. All right. Uh, how do flowers, plants reproduce. We're not going to get into human reproduction, but the idea here. Yep, Sarah, you are right. Um, yes, yes. Um, and we've been very cognizant in the new state assessment uh, and bringing people in to help with these lexile levels, uh, making sure the complexity of the sentence structure is appropriate making sure diagrams are appropriate, um, being what I will say more cognizant than when I had to give the older states tests. And there'll be another session next that I'll do with that. That's important. Um, so what they decide is after taking a look at some flowers, I always bring flowers in. I don't know if anybody has students with allergies or if you have allergies with the pollen. What I found has been acceptable is I will put, um, some pollen, a little bit of pollen on a piece of construction paper. And then I will put transparent tape, like the big white packaging tape, like over it, over it, over it, and over it. They can still see it, but there hasn't been that contact. And the parents have been fine with it. The nurse has been fine with it and things like that. So not going to, we haven't had any uh, situations like that. But they take a look at what the parts are. They take a look at, wait a minute, the stuff in the center of most flowers has to be like move somewhere because it has to help to grow a new plant. Um, and also know that, does anybody like coffee? All right, you might wanna plug your ears. So there's a coffee that's one of the most expensive coffees in the world. And there's this animal called a civet. Some of you know where I'm going with this. This might be the part that bugs you, but the civets eat the beans. And, yep, exactly. Read Lydia's comment. I don't even need to go there. So my point is that we know that everything does that, right? So you can carry seeds, uh, maybe on fur, things like that, not just pollen. But if you eat them, then the seeds can be transported that way as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I like coffee, but not, uh, I don't think I want to try the civet coffee. Okay, so here's the activity. They design a little critter. After they've had a chance to look at some things, um, some plants, some seeds, etc., they decide, do they want their critter that they get to design to carry pollen, which is represented by flower on the left-hand side, or do they want it to transport seeds? So that thing that has a circle of it um, on the bottom here, you can see that there's a burr attached there. These are actual examples, teacher made ones too. Um, up here, there's a little bunny who's caught uh, like dandelion, uh, little seeds. Um, over here, this little critter, these are um, chenille stems and or pipe cleaners, whichever you're allowed to say, but you can see how the flower is here. Uh, so what we do then, I don't know if you can see these little tracks of flower up here on the one on the right. 
is come to an agreement about how we're gonna test these because what they've done is they've looked at uh, things that need to be transported for reproduction for plants. They've looked at the materials available to them. They've decided, do I wanna carry a powder substance like a pollen? Do I wanna carry a seed? And again, they examine the materials that are available for them and deliberately choose the items based on what they want the animal's function to be. They build it and they test it. And again, if there's time, go back and revise and retest. So for testing the, um, the pollen, what we try to do is, and this is where lab tables are really great, even though they show a lot of dirt, or else we'll just uh, put darker construction paper out, is dip their feet in the flower and then just they get to move it this way and they can see how the tracks start to diminish and where they start to diminish the amount of flower. Um, the same thing with the seeds, they'll roll the organism in some seeds. Uh, I've used um, different uh, spices that are really cheap, right? That's a good way to get some things too. And then they kind of shake it as they go along. Uh, so we can see that now it's time to evaluate that maybe whatever was put on this little tail of what looks like a bunny to me was perfect for getting and collecting this little um, dandelion fuzz, it might not be really good for releasing that dandelion seed though. Uh, so again, the cause, the effect, um, the patterns that we're seeing there. Um, there's also in the materials that are on uh, digital comments, I have to get a chance to do this then, there's a PowerPoint put together that has some actual examples uh, and you can talk about, okay, what's going on with this animal? Why is it built this way? What beak structure, et cetera, do they have that helps them carry the seeds? It helps them carry the pollen. Okay. So those other books on the other page are some great ones. Most people really love chocolates. The idea kind of from farm to table of chocolate is there. And again, those are all on the list. All right, third grade, so much fun. And I admire you for teaching it because to me, they are similar to those, those pre-K and those kindergarten kids, just in a little bit different bodies. But the collaboration here is huge with the few things that we have them do um, in the lessons here. And now they're starting to have to explain, right? To justify, um, to communicate why something is happening. So what they're doing is they get lots of different stations um, and it can be as simple as a couple of tennis balls and they roll them back and forth to each other. They might put one stationary and roll one into it. They might roll it into the wall and then back, not throw it at the wall back, but sit down, roll it into the wall and back. And they're looking for patterns so that they can use these patterns to try to predict how this might work in the future. So they've taken it from, it was kindergarten where we talked about push and pull to get something going, right? So now they're gonna observe these objects in motion and start to see, wait a minute, if this does this, then like a pendulum can just be a washer and a string. So if I only pull it back this far, it does this. If I pull it back this far, it does this. So next time I can predict, you know, I think if I, the further I pull it back, the further it's gonna swing um, the other way, that further that motion, the greater that motion is. Uh, really quickly, a really good thing if you've never used it to um, like roll marbles down. And if you ever do something where you get into roller coasters, you know, those foam pipe, um, insulation pieces that are like five or six feet long and they're about this big around. If you slice them in half, they make really great tracks and they're very, very flexible. Um, so uh, you can see things that we're talking about here. One of the things that start, they're starting to get to, we're getting them to move from where we started in kindergarten to now is organizing how are you going to collect the data? What data are you going to collect? How are you going to put it together? So again, that organizational piece that you also have to do in writing. Now you'll notice that we're not telling them to memorize Newton's laws or the word momentum. Oh my gosh, momentum is so incredibly complex. Here's a book though, a traditional science trade book. You can do some really great things with illustrations, but I think it's on the second or third page. It gives away the answer and it doesn't give them a chance to explore it. It's kind of that traditional that somebody had mentioned before um, about making sure that you have that right vocabulary um, and not truly really comprehending, making sense of it. Okay. Uh, you know, you can find all sorts of examples of things moving. You can find uh, a video might be a really good thing, right? Some pictures might be a really good thing. This is a great place to come up with some other types of resources. The other thing is this, 
Remember earlier how I said you're so good at things? Guess what? You're good at writing. You can write informational text that your students are going to use. Make a three sentence, five sentence paragraph. Okay? Make a diagram. Those are all forms of writing. But if you're struggling because you don't want the stereotypical traditional science text that doesn't really help the students, write your own. That's good, right? You, you can do it. You can do it. I have faith in you. All right. So um, research and sources. Ooh, third grade doing research, right? They can, they can get information a lot of places, but remember if it is online, it is true, right? And so we have to, if you're gonna have your students start doing some research on their own, we need to start putting those skills in about uh, those computer skills, about computer literacy. Okay, so here's a whole bunch of different sources. Atlases, I love maps, I love maps, I love maps. Because okay? this next thing that they do, um, we'll get to is they're gonna be given a biome and they're gonna give a little bit of information about what might be a hazard that your uh, building, your house has to stand up to. And then they design a solution to that. So I Am the Storm uh, by Janet Yolen is really great, very simplistic writing, but the pictures are really, really good. And I felt as though some of the pictures represented weather that students might be familiar with in the Midwest. Okay. The Atlas, like we said, very factual, Google, um, so my question is, if you've ever read the true story of the three little pigs, it's from the wolf's perspective and goes and visits the three houses. Could you potentially use a book like that for science? Krista? I'm thinking yes, because then you could test out different things to see if it's true or not. Yes, you could. And it's lighthearted, right? Mm -hmm. The students won't get into it. Make that connection to the real science that goes along with it. But there, I will say, in my opinion, there is nothing. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly, Rachel. You can do this. I love that, taking that and relating that to the severe weather. That wolf was really severe, isn't it? Notice I said he, that wolf, today, it. Okay. So you can see these cards again are available for you to print out for the students, but they get an illustration, a picture. There's so much again, even though we're getting older and progressing in the grade levels, so many observations, quantitative and qualitative. So looking at pictures, making those observations, it's not numerical, but those are critical. Right? So they get a little something here. They get a little bit of information here. Desiree, I really like that. I really like that. Going back to the three little pigs there. Okay. So it's okay to give some information to them, all right? Um, to get a little bit of background because sometimes a little bit of background needs to be uh, built so that they can achieve the task and move on. But they're making a decision. They collect the materials that they want. They make it uh, design again, test it. And if there's time, go ahead and do the engineering process, kind of go through that cycle that we've labeled it as in, um, in education. Right. Oh, that, I like that, Lydia. I like that. And again, these are books that you commonly find in a classroom. These are different genres that the students read that you need to expose the students to. Make that connection. All right. It's okay for them to see that, you know what, ELA and science intersect. It's not science is over here in like this weird smelly room, um, what I'll call that museum smell kind of thing. And then ELA is way over here. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. Yes, I agree. <laughs> food chains. You could definitely get there, right? Food chains and food webs. So. Oh, you guys are great. Your archives are great. All right. So um, I'm just keeping a track on time because I can go. All right. Let's move to the next group, fourth and fifth grade. All right. Um, Again, you can see a little bit about how it's changed, um, you know, going to that next complexity, that next uh, level. Just like the science and engineering practices are going to advance developmentally um, based on our traits of our students. So the first time that they talk about patterns or their cross-cutting concepts, um, it's gonna look a little bit different at what we expect a kindergartner to talk, be able to talk about versus a fifth grader, the detail level. 
<laughs> so um, again, that whole evidence, uh, when I taught middle school, it was like, you just can't talk trash here. You have to back it up, right? And I said, if you get really good at it, you can convince your parents to let you do a lot of things or get that new basketball or you know, buy another book, et cetera. I don't know about your students, but a lot of students that I had, if you look over on the right hand, that speaking and listening portion, paraphrasing, summarizing, yeah, it just, it's tough. So this is a, a great uh, place to do this because when they write or talk about a science experience, a science experiment, we don't wanna hear on trial one, the marble went 22 centimeters. On trial two, the marble went 21 centimeters. We wanna hear, okay, when you release the marble from the highest point, generally what happened? What was that relationship, okay? So we need our students to start um, doing that. And that was just tough. Um, we all like to have our way, right? So setting rules that are, appropriate for how to talk with one another and how to respectfully disagree. There are, um, there should be, and if they're not, uh, drop me an email or have somebody else drop them in digital comments. There are some collaboration cards that we have for younger students, and there's a set for mathematical practices. Lindsay, who jumped in earlier, put these together first, and then there's another set for the older students about, all right, if we're gonna have this discussion, these are like five things I need to do and our group needs to agree to. So we have that respectful discourse situation going on. So let's take a look at a book. Again, some people said, wait a minute, I read this in second grade. They're called collaboration cards, Desiree. And let me write a note right now to myself to check to make sure they're on there. They are also in, um, if they're not in today's presentation information, if you go to the NGSS portion of our website, um, remember that digital, co digital commons, you will find them in there as well, okay? In there, you also find the teacher pages, student pages, handouts, uh, PowerPoints, anything that you would need as far as how we put that lesson together. But oftentimes, a, somebody might look at this, what do you do with a tale like this, which is an incredible book, and start to make the observations and think, oh yeah, this is really young. Well, you know what? In fourth grade, we get into the idea of structure and function. So some of you may have met uh, Pat Young, one of our incredible writers. He put together this idea of, um, you know what? We're gonna make some observations. We're gonna make some predictions based on those tales and try to explain why. And then we're going to make an organism. And we're gonna decide where it lives, what biome it lives in, what habitat it lives in. And there's all this information for you to um, go ahead and download. There are the, if we go back a page, um, you know, the two little characters that were there were made. Let's see if I can do this, there we go. All those patterns, all those templates are in your, um, in those handouts. And then if you open it up in their guts, because there are certain organs that have very specific purposes of structure and function. So those templates are in there as well. So then what they have to do is they have to pick where this organism is gonna live. And you can see in the backgrounds there, we have the sand snizzle and the moon moople, so they can get that imagination going, that creativity that you all mentioned before is so important. But you know, I just circled a few things on here, right? They're not, um, just saying it has this kind of beak, has this kind of tail, it has this kind of ear. It has this kind of ear because, right? It has these teeth because it has, uh, like with the moon moople, it has big eyes so that it can see better at night, right? Now, I will tell you some of these connections might not be quite correct. You can see uh, some humor there in that one with a flashy tail. Um, but they have, again, a specific structure that has a specific function. So that's how they've gotten there. Um, they're designing solutions um, to a problem there. Okay. So let's go on here. Well, it's, it's been freezing off and on today. So let's give it third time's charm, right? 
All right, so in fourth grade, oh my goodness, flooding, right? And uh, it seems like in Illinois over the last several years, we've been having some lots of flooding. So if you're in the northern part of the state, like by the chain of lakes in that area up there uh, in Algonquin, um, lots and lots of flooding uh, always going on. And then we have kind of that big river called the Mississippi uh, that has had flooding in lots of different places as well. So I am going to tell you, we've talked a little bit about developmental characteristics of students. We have to remember there's that emotional side to students. So we have to pick the books carefully. We talk a lot about natural disasters, climate change, the way it's presented, or if you look at the number of forest fires, that can be emotionally fright frightening, disturbing, right? I will tell you, for example, I put this book up here, even though we're looking at floods in this specific example, because it's about a forest fire. And it accurately describes what happens in a very emotionally safe realm. Okay, so just do be cautious of that. Flood is another picture book, uh, with very few words. Um, you see, I Am the Storm is here again. So these books can be used in different places, multiple places. With any of these, when you can bring in different cultures, uh, we are water protectors. There's so many different cultures that have uh, a different perspective on water, how to take care of it, et cetera. Um, the important, somebody mentioned uh, food chains before, but we can get into ecosystems with the mangrove uh, trees. And it talks a little bit about a storm that comes in and how that helps out. But what we wanna do is we wanna go again to a, um, a situation that they're familiar with. We're gonna present them with a problem. They're gonna learn a little bit about flooding and how they could potentially mitigate it. But again, there are so many opportunities here to uh, some and bring in culturally responsive teaching. Okay, so they're observing, they're making a plan, they're solving the problem, hopefully, or mitigating it somewhere. And again, some of our students, they wanna solve it completely. All right. And one thing in science is we find this little piece of information and then we find a new piece of information and it feel no pun intended, but science is always evolving what we know. So we've just used sand. We use some um, like Ziploc kind of not whatever brand, you know, like Gladware kind of things that you can wash out and reuse. The type of container is not important. It's just important that it contains the mess. Right? We had out um, paper we had out, those are like um, from down at the bottom, those are little uh, needle point type circles that I found really cheap, I think at Hobby Lobby or Michael's someplace like that. But we give them a shape of a river to put in originally, put a little bit of water in so they can see what happens. They have rivers that are different ages, uh, fairly young, meandering to where they even made a lake at the bottom of Oxbow Lake. Um, and then they figure out what happens and that it can flood. So how are you going to help, for example, the houses there on the left hand, uh, picture kind of on the center left hand side. How are you going to protect those houses? There's a town, I believe, in it's either Western Illinois or in Iowa, that they actually moved the town up the hill to avoid the flooding that was down below and devastating their town the whole time. Um, so, lots of different books again that you can do with this, um, and lots of connections to ELA. And I just got the message that we're almost out of time here. Oh, come on. Quit being stuck. All right. There we go. All right. So um, I found a new great book the other day. Uh, I have the cover there. But it's about uh, these women uh, that take in plastic bags. They twist them and they turn them into knitting like yarn and they make these uh, bags that you can reuse over and over again. So lots of different things here. You've seen some of these before. The mangrove tree is an actual project that occurred, which was pretty cool to see something. Um, I bring this in here, the out of the dust because we can use historical fiction to help it out. This is a journal about the dust bowl from a child's perspective. Okay, um, so please use those. Karen Hess does really, really great books if you've never read them at all or had your students read them. Another great place that your students at this age are really good about finding out is um, newspapers, okay? Going back in the archives and finding them. Because what we're doing here is we're taking a look once they go to the Dust Bowl, 
about the relationships among the different. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Chris. I just learned about that. And it just arrived last night. So I didn't put it in the PowerPoint. Uh, it's a great, great book. Uh, so thank you for that. But please take a look at all these different places. Here we're getting into the atmosphere, biosphere, geosphere, and hydrosphere, and how they all impact one another. Okay. So you've got that application, which again, if we go back to your informational text and writing, we have that application when we do those explanations. So Let's try this. You have been wonderful. I hope that this has helped you a bit, but please remember this. You definitely are. So we're going to do this and.